The Rebel Capitalist Show. Recently, you've been talking a lot about uh, COVID and the lockdowns mm -hmm. and how we should really think this through from a standpoint of, uh, you know, libertarianism and personal freedom. And I just spoke with Bob Murphy. And one of the questions that I asked him about is why are principles, especially when we're looking at things like this, so important? And in, if I, if, just to make the question more specific, you know, you get a lot of politicians that just kind of uh, test the wind in whichever direction it's blowing. That's what they that, that's what their stance is on a particular position. But you've got someone like Ron Paul, who is very principled. And it wouldn't matter what position it was, it wouldn't matter what pop or how popular or unpopular his stance was, he had that North Star. So why do you think principles are so important? Well, let's give a practical reason. Right now, if it hadn't been for people with principles, there would be no alternative to the mainstream narrative. And so everyone would be buying into the idea that Dr. Fauci saved 2 million people and the only reason we have outbreaks is because of people's quote unquote bad behavior. And if only they would listen to the public health establishment, this thing would have gone away and all the rest of it. Now that is patently false at this point as more and more people are figuring out because after 14 months, you have a lot of data and you have a lot of charts that reveal the truth of the matter. But if we hadn't had people who from the beginning were gonna be skeptical of these demands that were being made of the public, then it would be this, the, the, everyone would be of one mind and that would be extremely unproductive. Who, who knows what they would have gotten away with if there hadn't been any resistance at all. But it's because, for example, even though he's not a libertarian like us, but frankly, it was courageous of Governor Ron DeSantis yeah. to say, I'm opening up the state 100% capacity. Whatever limits there are, they're not, they're not on me. That now, that was founded in, in genuine science, not the phony baloney version. But, there, but as I've said before, he must have had some sleepless nights anyway, though, wondering about what might happen. And then, as we know, of course, nothing happened. Uh, Florida is below average in deaths. That, that is to say, when you look at all 50 states, it's somewhere around 27 or 28, even though when it comes to the, the age of the population, it's in the top handful. Right. So it should be way, way up there, given that and given how open it was. So thank goodness we had somebody who was going to say, no, I just, I'm not going to let this happen to the people who live here. Or as, as I say, otherwise, it would be nothing but propaganda. Mm, right. and, and this is true, by the way, you think of a lot of, go back to um, not my favorite person in the world, but Noam Chomsky has a book called Manufacturing Consent. And there, um, I think there's a useful thesis that comes out of that. Because we think of some of the, we think of like the war in Iraq in 2003. Well, that people soured on that as years went on. They looked back and said, well, this didn't work out the way we wanted, or it was an enormous expenditure of resources. And now it's completely chaotic. And there have been two to 4 million people displaced and not to mention the deaths and all that. So, but there were, there were that handful who in 2003 said, here's exactly what's going to happen. And they laid it out. And those exact things happened. So for the sake of society, we need, we need to accumulate examples where when the establishment later says, gee, maybe we shouldn't have done that, we can say, well, but you know what? Guess what? There were people who told you you shouldn't have done that. And then they, these are the same people who told you you shouldn't do the lockdowns. Uh, these are the same people who told you you shouldn't have the expansionary monetary policy that would lead to a housing bubble. You notice a pattern here? Time after time, the establishment says, huh, I guess, well, I guess we just didn't see that coming, or I guess no one could have seen that coming. No, see, we cut them off at the knees because you can't say no one could have seen that coming because for the most part, even now, the internet is forever, and doggone it, we did see it coming. Yeah, you know, going back to the Iraq war, that's such a good example of, you know, maybe a position that Ron Paul might have had back then that was anti the Iraq war. And it seems kind of like a like a nothing burger today. But making that decision based on those principles back then would have been extraordinarily difficult. 
And I know in my own experience, it's similar to yours. When COVID first came out, you know, I was doing videos on it in January 2020 saying that, listen, you know, th this could be something that, that's bad here. This R not yeah. value. You got to look at this thing. You know, the, the serious uh, case rate, I forgot what they called it. You know, that's a lot higher. We, we, we got to take notice here. But in my own mind, I'm thinking, you know, it, it seems as though or it feels like these lockdowns are what we should do based on the gravity of the situation and the fact that we just don't have the data. But then I just kept going back and forth. And finally, I said, you know what? My principles are limited, small government, and they should not intrude on our life. Therefore, I'm going to stick to that. And my position is, although this may be bad right now, we don't have all the data. The bottom line is the government should not get involved. And back then, that was a very difficult decision to make. Well, I agree completely, and, and I'll just be uh, straightforward and say that in March, I was concerned too. I wasn't doing episodes on it uh, sooner than that, but I was concerned about it I, I, because, because of the unknown. Yeah, you know, Who knows how, what this is going to be? And uh, I was not aware at that time of the age stratification in terms of deaths. Mm -hmm. So I don't know who's, who's at risk, and I don't know how many people could die, especially if the numbers they were initially giving us were were correct that I was actually wondering, gee, I wonder who among my friends, and I have many after years and years of traveling the country, are going to perish because of this thing. And it turns out it's zero. You're right. But, but I, I was worried about it. And so my initial reaction was, I'm going to probably, well, I, I, I think I've told this story, but I was set to go to a concert. I think it was March 17th. And the question was, should I go or not? And I, and I went back and forth and then I decided, you know, I think probably I'll just go. Uh, there were other things where I, I decided, you know, like we, we had a, you know, my, my daughter, uh, Sarah, was turning six on um, Mar March, four, uh, March 13th. And a lot of parents were calling up saying, you know, we hate to leave you hanging out to dry here, but we just don't know what's going on. I, I, right. I don't think we can come. And I wasn't bitterly angry at them <laughs> for falling for government propaganda. I thought that was quite understandable under the circumstances. Now, as it turns out, the concert I wanted to go to got postponed at the last minute, so the decision was made for me. But, but, but nevertheless, I was cautious about it. And, and, but I, I didn't think anyone needed to tell me what to do. That's I thought point. If, if I perceive this to be a danger to myself, why would I do it? I don't need the government to tell me that if I go, um, I don't know. Well, I'm, I'm trying to think of risky behavior. So I'm thinking of skydiving, but I don't want all the skydivers to write to me and say, actually, it's extremely safe. <laughs> okay, I, I'm sure it is, right? But, but the average person <laughs> thinks it's a risky behavior. I don't need the government to tell me that. I, I can tell jumping out of a plane probably carries its risks. Likewise, walking around during a pandemic, I get that there are, there are risky things that, uh, out there, but... I'm probably best at balancing those risks. And the thing is that what's happened with our, what we laughingly call the public health establishment is that of course they've acted as if there's only one threat in the world. It's all, all right. COVID. Right. Now, 45% of the deaths in the US have occurred in nursing homes. I don't live in a nursing home and maybe I will someday, but I don't now. And, 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 the, and a lot of the other, now they've just done a, a, an audit saying that at least one third of the um, child deaths, or I can't remember if it was hospitalizations or deaths uh, that were attributed to COVID actually had no connection to COVID whatsoever. Now we all knew that was that had to be the case. And it turns out it is. They're now admitting, the USA Today admitted that. But there are other concerns that you can have in your life. I, I don't want my family completely isolated. Sure. I don't want their lives ruined. I, I don't want people's businesses. Like, yeah, I have a child's birthday party business that involves riding horses. Okay, there are people like that whose lives have been ruined because of superstitious people. You're not gonna get the virus riding a horse outdoors. You're just not, that's not how it works. Mm -hmm. uh, and and the, the collateral damage was only acknowledged by the World Health Organization around October. They finally said, right. you know, there can be collateral damage here. I don't know what to tell these people. I mean. So it seems to me that individuals are best at balancing all the different factors that go into 
the risks that that uh, comprise everyday life. Yeah, I completely agree. And it just boils down to the government giving you the data and then allowing the individuals and the businesses to make their own decisions. (laughs) 